Hello, hello. So I have a question for you. What does a for sale sign made in tags on your clothing or on uh, different items in your house and global transportation machines like airplanes or cargo boats or 18 wheelers? What do all of those things have in common? Do, 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 do. Oh, well, of course. They all have to do with the geographic theme of movement. Exactly. That's what we were all thinking. Now, that is exactly the topic that we are going to be focusing on during today's mini lesson. So your essential question, what we're kind of really trying to answer here is what does the geographic theme movement mean? Just in your own words, what does it mean? So by the end of this video lesson, you should be able to describe and give examples of the movement of people, goods, and ideas. So let's dive right in and get to our learning. Oh, as a quick reminder, your graded notes, like we already discussed, is what will be your way of showing what you've learned. So it's very important that you're including as much detail as possible in those notes. And beyond the fact that it's going to be graded, this is also a resource for you. So you want to create a set of notes that is going to be helpful if we have a quiz in the future, or if we have to look back on those notes for our learning. So make sure that we are completing those notes to the best of our ability. Now, the last thing I'd like to share with you before we move forward are some of the key vocabulary terms that you're going to have your eyes peeled nice and wide for and looking for um, while we go through the presentation. So beyond just looking for them, I would highly, highly suggest that you include these five very important vocabulary terms in your own notes. So those terms are going to be push and pull factors, immigrants, refugees, imports and exports, and finally, the term origin. So keep an eye out for those terms throughout the rest of the mini lesson. And when you see them, I would suggest pausing your video and including those, uh, those terms in your own notes. So getting started here, movement. Overall, movement is the study of how goods and materials, people, and ideas move around the globe. So take a moment to go ahead and include those three blanks on your note sheet. Now that you have had a moment to record the basic definition of movement, we're now going to break that definition into its three parts and look at each of those types of movement to get an understanding of what exactly it is and to also look for some specific examples. So we're first going to start with the movement of people. And when we think about the movement of people, it's important to think about a couple of important things. Transportation is the first that comes to mind, right? When we're thinking of people moving, we're thinking about, do folks drive cars? Do people drive bikes? Are there giant um, airports or highways near that location or near that place? Are there railroads that people might take? Or is it an area where maybe camels and snow machines are more the common uh, transportation. So the movement of people is kind of an easy starting point because we're asking, how do people move? Now, beyond their transportation needs, we also want to think a little bit about the housing needs that sometimes cause people to move. Sometimes people move because they want to live in the suburbs or in the city. Sometimes people move because they maybe don't want to live in a suburb or a city and they'd rather live in more of a rural area. We can also ask questions about when people move. Are they moving to what type of house? Are they moving to a new house or an old house? Are they living in an apartment or a home or maybe a tree house or maybe a, a travel van? So it's important that when we're considering the movement of people, we think about both their transportation needs and their housing needs. Now, that's kind of a small and local picture when we're thinking about the movement of people. We're thinking about how do individual people move or how do, um, why would some people leave a, a rural kind of area to come to a more urban or city type of area. But now what we're looking at on this next slide is more the bigger picture of movement. And so I'd first like to take your eyes over here to the right side of our screen where we see that little map. 
Now, every one of those little dots that you see moving around the map are representing people, are representing humans that are moving or migrating from one place to another. Now, as geographers, we're really interested in why people move. So what we use are two terms, and those terms are both push and pull factors. And essentially, a push and a pull factor are the things that either pull a person to a place or that push them away. So if we're, for example, if we're focusing on the United States here, there are a lot of little yellow dots um, uh, bringing people to the United States. So you might consider what are some of the pull factors? What are some of the things that make people want to come to the United States? On the opposite end of that, I see a lot of little yellow dots leaving the Middle East, leaving North Africa. So we might ask ourselves, what are some of the push factors? What are some of the things that are making those people want to leave their homeland behind? Now, the final step of the bigger picture here of the people of movement is then what do we call those people that are either being pushed or pulled to different um, countries? So first of all, an immigrant. An immigrant is a person or persons who choose to move to another country, and they're usually going to stay permanently. So there's a lot of us in our class here whose families, or maybe even you individually, are immigrants. You moved from another country or your family moved from another country. And in most cases, we were pulled to the United States because of some of the things that this country offers. Offers safety, offers opportunity, offers um, jobs and, 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 and freedom, right? Those are some of the pull factors that bring people to our country. There's an incredible inscription on the Statue of Liberty written by Emma Lazarus, and it goes as follows. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, your wretch, wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. The idea being that the Statue of Liberty is something that represents a pull factor, represents coming to the United States to stay here permanently. Now, there's also another side to the movement of people. And I would point out that when we were talking about immigrants, the word chooses is very important. Because when we are talking about refugees, that choice isn't necessarily a part of the equation. Because a refugee is a person or persons who are forced to leave their homeland due to the threat of violence or harm. So we can think about those as push factors. We are being pushed, refugees are being pushed out of their homeland because of those threats. So the decision is not really like, hey, I would really like to move to this other country. In a refugee situation, it's normally, we got to leave or our family could be hurt or in some cases even killed. So when we as geographers think about the movement of people, it is so much more than just, I drive a car to get to school. It's much, much bigger and more complex than that. So before we move forward to the next slide, I would highly suggest that you pause your video here and take a moment or two to kind of reflect on and record the information that you've learned in your graded note sheet. Thank you and welcome back. So we know that there are three different types of movement that we focus on as geographers. And to, next, we are going to look at the movement of goods and materials. Now, what this essentially means is that we are looking at how do the things that we use every day or the materials that we never even think of in our cell phones or clothes, how do they get here? I don't know of a single avocado tree in Colorado. Well, there probably are some. There's not many, but we have avocados in the store. So how did those different goods and materials get to our specific location? So first of all, there are two very important key terms here that I would suggest taking a moment to write down in your notes. Those terms are exports and imports. Now, the prefix of those words are what's going to be very important for you to focus on. So when we're talking about exports, the prefix is X, E-X. 
which to me reminds me of exit or leaving. So exports are goods and materials that are shipped out of a country to another. So those countries are exiting or being exported from one country and going to the United States or going to another. So, so sorry. So when we think about exports, it means that something, if we use our own country, something is created or made in the United States and then shipped to another country. Now, the opposite of that is also true. There are also goods and materials that are known as imports. And if we're once again focusing on the prefix, im means that we're bringing in or that it is um, coming into. So imports are goods and materials that have been shipped into a country from another. So a major um, country that we see a lot of imports from in our country, the United States, is we see a lot of goods from China. We see a lot of goods from Bangladesh. We see a lot of clothes from India, right? So there are a lot of products that are in our country that have been imported or brought into the United States. Now, beyond just those basics, it's really important to realize that this trading of both imports and exports, this global trade of um, goods and materials has a huge impact on our economy by impacting jobs, by creating manufacturing, and also just simply transporting that um, those goods and, and materials around the world. So I found this really interesting thematic map that I wanted to share with you, and it shows the biggest export in every state about three years ago in 2017. So it's interesting. If we come down here and focus on, let me go ahead and make my clicker a little focuser here. If we focus on Colorado for a moment, the biggest export in Colorado in the year 2017 was a food type of category. We see our categories down here in the bottom right in our key. And it was specifically beef, $512 million worth of beef was exported out of the state of Colorado. Now let's go and look at a different state on here. Um, so I'm going to look down here at Texas. Texas. Texas is this little green or jade kind of color, turquoise. So I'm going to come over here. That means it's a fuel type of category. And in Texas, the biggest export in 2017 was petroleum oil at more than $23,365 million worth of exports. So it's just incredible. And I suggest you take a moment or two to kind of look over this, um, this, this thematic map to kind of just see the difference from state to state of what it is that each state exports and makes the most money from. Now, as I just pointed out, it's important to realize that every one of those dollar amounts means jobs for U.S. workers, jobs to package, jobs to produce, right? So let's, let's think about corn for a moment. There was a few states on there whose major export was corn. So there's a whole process to that corn being sold and making money, right? There has to be a farmer that's out working the field, making and growing those corn, um, those corn goods. Then it goes from the farm to a factory where it has to be picked, it has to be processed, it has to be cleaned up. Then after it's uh, processed in the factory, it moves to some packaging company that's then gonna package it and make it look all pretty so that it can wind up on your shelves and then you can enjoy a nice corn on the cob. So it's important to realize that every step in that process has jobs, every step in that process has an economic impact. Now, the same is true the opposite way. If things are being imported from other countries, that means that it's going to go through a process as well. So it's going to start in a factory, whether that is a, a, clo a piece of clothing or whether that is some electronic good. It's going to start in a factory and be produced. Then after it's produced, it's going to be put on a giant ship or on a giant airplane that's going to take it to the country that it's being brought to. After it's on that big ship, it's then going to make its way to a train here in the United States, get on our big railway system, and after it's been delivered to its location, boom shakalaka, it's on that department store shelf. So the point is, and it's important to realize, that there are once again opportunities for jobs in every one of these situations. This boat is not just going to load itself. These trains is not, are not just going to drive themselves. 
these articles of clothing were not just put on the shelves by themselves. There is an opportunity for jobs and economic benefit in every one of these steps. So as we wrap up the movement of goods and materials portion of this video lesson, I suggest that you pause the video here and take a moment or two to simply look back and reflect on what it is that you know about the movement of goods and materials. Finally, the definition of geographic movement is studying the, or studying the movement of goods, people, and ideas around the world. So as we talk about the movement of ideas, we're going to start kind of in your own life, in the smaller or more local and immediate kind of example. So, for example, think about how the following things can move. Think about how rumors might move throughout the day. You know, we see this little picture here of one person tells one person, who tells another, who tells another, who tells another. And before we know it, that idea or that rumor has spread all the way around the school, all the way around the grade level, all the way around the community. The same can be true about memes. We all see one funny meme, we share it with our friend, that person shares it with three of their friends, and before we know it, we're all coming to school saying, Seuss though, right? Like, it's just those little things that, that um, those ideas are moving from person to person around the globe. Some other examples we see up here, obviously, um, we live in an age of cell phones where we all just text each other super easily. Those cell phones also give us access to social media, right? Where we can go and post information and that information is not just shared with you. It doesn't just go into a vacuum. It goes to the entire world and those ideas have the opportunity to spread. Now, we started with kind of the, how does this affect me? And now we're gonna take a moment to look at kind of the big picture, once again, of the movement of ideas. Because it's one thing to just say, oh, rumors can move around the school. Well, yeah, that's true. But we also gotta realize that the movement of ideas can be a huge and global thing. So for example, and kind of the easiest one to think of is religion, religion. Every single one of the religions that you see posted up here and every religion that you are aware of has spread around the world. Take the major three monotheistic religions. We have Christianity, we have Judaism, we have Islam. All three of those countries, or all three of those religions, excuse me, started in a completely different part of the world. But those ideas, those beliefs, spread around the world, just like a rumor might have, just like an idea or a belief has the opportunity to do. We can also see the way that culture can spread, the idea of McDonald's or the idea of fast food or Chinese food. For any of us that, that have ever had Panda Express or McDonald's, the idea that those same restaurants were inspired by ideas or recipes or food items around the world is interesting to consider. The fact that we can look at this little picture of a McDonald's in what I'm assuming is maybe France or Italy and think that they have a Big Mac in Italy? That's an idea that started in the United States and has moved elsewhere. We can also see examples of when kind of political systems might spread around the world. We can see where cultural kind of movements like Black Lives Matter or environmentalism might move around the world. And finally, one I'd like to leave you with, even though there are many, many more, is realizing how technology and innovation can spread around the, uh, the world. The idea that we get sick or people get hurt because of bacteria, not because of some crazy supernatural force out there causing us to be sick, is an idea that has moved around the world. So we now see sanitation and, and proper healthcare kind of situations all around the world. And lastly, I would like to leave you with one final thought because certainly the movement of ideas can be a good thing, even though, um, let's see, even though Panda Express is inspired by food elsewhere, and I really love what Panda Express created, I wanna go just point out here that sometimes these movement of ideas can have kind of a negative impact sometimes too. So the final picture that's listed on this slide for you is 
one of the first atomic bombs. Our country, the United States, was one of the first, along with Russia and certainly others that were in the mix, but one of the first to develop that type of technology. Gave us an incredible military advantage during World War II, but guess what? Now there are countries all around the world that have that exact same technology, that exact same weaponry. And so it's important to stop and realize sometimes that we live in an age where ideas can spread in a matter of seconds. I can post something on the internet, and in a matter of minutes, millions of people could have seen the same thing. So it's important to realize sometimes that the ideas that have the power to move around the world don't always wind up being positive. Now, finally, I'd like to leave you with one last thought to consider when you're thinking of the movement of ideas. And that final thought is I would suggest to ask or be willing to ask yourself this question. What is the origin of blank? Now, origin is it's, it's kind of the root of original, right? So origin means the point or place where something begins. So for example, if we look on the right side of our screen right now, the top picture is some of the earliest or first representations of skiing hundreds of years ago. So my question would be is how does something that started like this as an act of hunting to go and try to capture food and feed your village or your city, how does something like that become something like this? Where people are zooming down a mountain at 60 miles an hour just to jump and try to fly for 200 feet or whatever. What is kind of the origin of skiing really gets you into some of those deeper and kind of fascinating thoughts about where did this idea come from? And I would just point out that most of the time you're gonna be surprised by that answer. So can I give you one other example? For all my Italian friends out there, the people who love and mentioned in your Flipgrid that, that spaghetti or maybe lasagna or maybe pasta is your favorite food, you wanna know something interesting? Until about, I don't know, let's see, about 500 years ago, Italy never knew what a tomato was. Tomatoes had never been to Europe or Africa or Asia. But that food, once brought over to Europe, wound up becoming the absolute foundation of so many Italian rest or recipes and food. So it's important to just think about and sometimes ask yourself the question, what is the origin of blank? What is the origin of skateboarding? What is the origin of the internet? What is the origin of, of Christianity or of Judaism or of Islam? So be curious because that's what geographic movement allows us to do. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you were able to learn a little bit about the movement of ideas, the movement of people, and the movement of goods and materials. Please take a few moments to make sure that your notes include all of the details that you would like to. Remember, this is a graded assignment and one that as soon as you are finished up, please submit your final work on Schoology so that Mr. Edwards can review and give you feedback. Thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of your day.